Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar of 2022. So my name is Katrina, and I am part of the Irish Support Agency Committee, and I am delighted to introduce to you our new home of our monthly webinars called DOHAS, previously known as the Irish 30. So DOHAS is a word to describe hope and trust, um, which is very fitting and very suited to um, the sessions that we have exploring all the different aspects of um, health and well-being. So DOHAS happens on the first Monday of every month and mm -hmm. all previous webinars can be found in, on the Irish Support Agency website. So, so before we begin, I would like to start with a welcome to country. Um, in spirit of reconciliation, the Irish Support Agency acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples tonight. So tonight's webinar, Riding the Wave, is about understanding anxiety, um, navigating through life and regaining resilience and looking at how we can look towards a future um, undefined by COVID. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the, the comments box and we'll leave some time at the end for you to, to um, explore the, the open questions. And so tonight we are joined with the beautiful Helen O'Brien, um, originally from Dublin and um, moved to Australia in 1995, is that correct? That's right, a long time. Yes. Long, long time. So she is a highly experienced registered um, integrative psychotherapist and one of our solace practitioners as well. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, can you just give us um, a little bit of about yourself and about your background? Sure. So as you said, I've been here since 1995, so quite a long time. Um, and I have a holistic clinic, which is just when you hop over the bridge here in um, Sydney, about five minutes from the Opera House, and it is holistic. Um, it's a holistic clinic. So we're clinical psychologists, um, psychotherapists, kinesiologists, and I really believe in everyone finding the right type of therapy, finding what it is that really works for you. So my background is in anxiety, somatic psychotherapy, which really means working with the body, um, PTSD, uh, trauma. So I have done a lot of, uh, lot of work in trauma. And as a holistic psychotherapist, um, really the basis of, of all my work is really the connection between mind and body. So if you think, you know, some people think, well, I have a body as opposed to I am a body. For me, it's very much our mind, our body is connected. So I work very much mind, body, heart, soul, spirit. And, um, you know, I love to bring in creativity into my work um, and really look at different ways that we can really, when we have disturbances in the psyche, that we can express those. So whether it is through talk therapy, but whether it's through art, whether it's through music, um, and I love nothing more than bringing in the ancient Celtic ways. Uh, we have such rich, such a richness in our Celtic um, spirituality and our Celtic energy. So that really is the, you know, it's it, that's what integrative is. It's bringing in a lot of different modalities of therapy, um, as long as the, uh, you know, alongside the evidence-based therapies, which I do work with. But that's well, that's that sounds that sounds beautiful. So. We all worry or get anxious about things um, mm -hmm. in life. And can you talk about the difference between, you know, normal experiences of life mm -hmm. and when anxiety becomes um, more of an issue? Yeah, that's a great question, Katrina, because we all experience fear, worry, doubt. Um, we all have moments where we're anxious about experiences. You know, you're a teenager and he's got an exam coming up and he's really anxious about that experience. Or, you know, you're coming out of a car park at 11 at night and you see three gouges in the corner and, you, you know, your fear kicks in. You know, that's a normal experience. Or you're worried, you know, you're worried about something, you know, whether somebody is, you know, OK and you want to check down in on them. So we, we go through life and we have normal fear, doubt and worry. 
what happens with those they tend to be um, something you know whether it's a presentation at work or an exam that you're anxious about you do it and then it's like a short term and then it's kind of like a it's done you kind of expend that energy okay it's been in the short term or if you have a you know as I said of this you know, three people there that you want to avoid coming out of the car park, you know, your fear, and then it's done. So you're not stuck on fear. I mean, that's really, you're, you're in that fearful moment or you've had the doubt and then it switches off and then you're back into what we call homeostasis. Your nervous system is back regulated. For somebody who has anxiety and is really living every day with anxiety, that's not what they're experiencing. So somebody who has anxiety they're waking up with anxiety, they may be going to bed with anxiety, they might have anxiety throughout the whole day, they're permanently switched on on. And um, so it's a very, very big difference. And um, what, you know, and, and it's debilitating, right, it's affecting every moment of their life. And what has happened now in the vernacular and how we talk about anxiety, it's a little bit of like mental health, we Somebody might say, well, I've got really, really bad anxiety, my anxiety is really bad. And you know, people will you know, chime in and they'll say, well, oh yeah, we have anxiety or my friend has anxiety or somebody else might say, oh, don't be such a worry, just take a chill pill or if you do some breathing or, you know, don't worry so much. But we're not comparing apples with apples. You know, that's the real thing. We're not comparing, these are not the same things. So it's really important to make that distinction up front because somebody who is experiencing it day in, day out, and it is debilitating, it's really important that they, you know, they, their experience is validated for a start and also that they get the proper support because if they don't, then it can manifest and, and kind of go into different anxiety disorders or self-harm or, or et cetera. So it really is important that uh, you separate those differences of what's normal and then what's, so it's really the time factor, what's persistent. So you mentioned anxiety disorders. Um, can you explain the types that we should be aware of? So there is, you know, most people, if they do go to a GP and they get diagnosed with anxiety, a lot of people get diagnosed with, um, which is a general anxiety disorder. And with a general anxiety disorder, it always exists with other comorbidities. So there's always something else alongside it. So it might be an eating disorder with anxiety. It might be addiction with anxiety. Um, it might be trauma with anxiety. So there's always a comorbidity with it. Um, with um, other disorders, we have post-traumatic stress disorder. We have um, social anxiety disorder. We have obsessive compulsive disorder. So we have, you know, it's, it's really important to understand that there are different types of anxiety because the treatment for each of those is very different. But the one thing I would say, um, which is, is the absolute kind of the most important thing is everyone really has to understand what is the root cause of your anxiety. Because if 20 people came into my practice tomorrow and they all said, Helen, I have anxiety. If I was to just kind of go and take out, you know, from the top shelf, well, here's all the psychological tools for anxiety. And there are some that are specifically designed without really understanding what their experience is, what's the root cause. I could really, really miss the mark as a therapist, because if the root cause of that anxiety is trauma that happened 20 years ago, I really should be working with the trauma that happened 20 years ago. If the root cause is postnatal depression, I really should be saying, okay, let's refer you to somebody who works with postnatal depression. If the root cause is addiction, we have to work with the addiction first. Um, so understanding the root cause for every individual is, is probably the thing I would say, you know, we, we kind of live in a world where, you know, we're kind of given everyone should do this and everyone should do that. But as the incredible John O'Donoghue, who uh, my favorite Irish poet said, you know, we, we all are unique and there's not one other person in this earth. People might have similar experiences, but there's not one other person on this earth that's lived your exact inner world. No one has had those experiences. So unless you really kind of take a little bit of time to, you know, look at your own biography and understand what, you know, what's happened, because it's, it's not so much the events in our life, but it's the inner experiences of those events that can create a lot of that anxiety. So understanding the root cause. Um, and then um, rather than kind of, I suppose, classifying people into disorders straight away, that's how I sort of approach working with anxiety. 
Oh, very good. That was really well explained. And have you noticed, are there some people more prone to anxiety than, than others? I think everyone is vulnerable. And especially at the moment, the last two years, I've, you know, I've seen more and more and more because we've had what's called free floating anxiety. And um, that's anxiety that you can't really, you know, it's not that you actually even know, it's just been in the ether, it's been the energy that's in the field, it's just has been constant. So I've seen a lot of people who I previously were quite resilient, who, who have, you know, had a lot more anxiety, but in general, um, certain personality types are more prone, you know, people who are very perfectionist, you know, in their sort of their thinking and their way of being that might have very strong inner critics like, you know, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you're not enough, I'm not good enough, you know, all of that. So very strong inner critic, perfectionist type personalities often present with anxiety, people with a family history, we often see, but I really think now um, everyone's quite vulnerable, like everyone is quite vulnerable, you know, something could happen in life, a transition or, you know, if something you know, if there's a, a sudden shock or, you know, I think we're all, as we're navigating life, we're all quite vulnerable to experiencing anxiety. Yeah, especially with um, the past few years that we've, we've had, it's, it's been an unexpected event for everyone. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned earlier about the mind-body connection. And can you just talk about what happens to the body when we experience anxiety? Yeah. So there's always a three part or a three aspect part to anxiety, regardless of what psychological tool you use. Anxiety is always, we're always looking at what's happening here at a cognitive um, level. So what's happening, you know, in, in the brain and, and um, in this area, we're looking at the physiology, we're looking what's happening in the physical body and we're looking at the behavior. So we're always looking at those three aspects. There's always those three aspects to anxiety. What I think is, you know, a lot of people are quite well versed on what's happening with their thoughts or they've, you know, previously maybe seen a lot of tools or been given a lot of tools, you know, and over the years we've had, you know, a lot of psychological tools or CBT or, you know, different ways of helping people reframe their thoughts or looking at their cognitive distortions and helping them identify or bring awareness to different styles of thinking. But for me, I think when you understand what's happening in the body, when you really do, because we all know when you feel fear, like when you feel fear, you feel it, you, you, you feel it in your stomach. You know, when you have anxiety, you put your feet on the floor, you feel it. You're, when you're having you know, anxiety rising, you can feel your heart beating out of your chest. You know, you can feel that arising. So it is all, you know, it's very much in the somatic body. So when we learn kind of what's happening and what really is happening is there isn't there really isn't any if there's any yoga practitioners tuning in they, they might know this or kinesiologists but we have a nerve that runs um from literally the back of our neck and it runs all the way down to the end of our spine and it's called the vagus nerve and this nerve that you know it literally runs the whole length and it then spreads out. And I do have a diagram there, which I'll try and bring up later, but it does spread out. In Latin, the word vagus means wandering. So it hits every single organ in the body. And the reason why this is so important is because it does hit every single organ in the body, then it branches out into our parasympathetic and our sympathetic nervous system. And a lot of people are familiar with our parasympathetic and our sympathetic. So our parasympathetic is what is responsible for our rest and our digest. We don't even think about, you know, our digestion. We don't even think about it. That's the parasympathetic. The sympathetic part of our nervous system is what is responsible for our fight or flight. And, you know, it comes off this vagus nerve. And why this is really, really important for us to really kind of understand is that our brains are hardwired for survival. Our brains aren't hardwired for joy. They're not hardwired um, for happiness. They're hardwired for survival. And when you understand that, then you can realize that any threat that comes in, it is going to activate your fight or flight. And for, um, sorry, just got a drink. For our ancestors, they, when, you know, that's a, it's a mechanism in the body that once you have any fear, any sense of danger that comes along, the fight or flight kicks in, your, bloody, your body is flooded with hormones 
And um, then once the danger is over, you know, you move on. What is happening now is that for people who are experiencing anxiety, that fight or flight is just continuous. It's like you put your foot on the, you know, on the gas and you are just down and you're flooding the body constantly with the stress hormone cortisol. And it's flooding through the, it's flooding through the body. Now, um, you know, when we understand that, then we can understand that we are going to, we know we're going to feel that in the body when it's constantly flooding us. Um, any therapist that does a lot of work with trauma or with anxiety from a somatic perspective and all of the research uh, from Dr. Uh, Peter Levine um, or Stephen Porges, uh, what, you know, what we have looked at is really that animals, when they're in the wild and animals have the same physiology um, as, um, you know, as us, when they are under threat, if a leopard is under threat and, sorry, I'd, I'd say a deer has been chased by a leopard and it's running and it's, it does the exact the same thing. It releases all the fear, all the stress hormones. It goes into fight or flight into the sympathetic nervous system. It gets away. And then once it gets away, then it shakes. Okay. And this is a really important point for anyone listening. It actually, the, the animals shake, they shake out, they disperse that energy. So they don't get stuck. They're not then moving on allowing that to, you know, they switch it off. Whereas what happens to us is we get stuck in this feedback, feedback loop. So we don't switch off. So it's a constant surge of this stress hormone through the body. And um, I think when we can understand that, when we understand what is actually then happening in the body, we can, you know, then we can start to recognize that we need to we recognize them, we've come out of what's called our window of tolerance. So our window of tolerance is where we feel calm, cool, collected, where we feel, you know, safe. When a threat comes in, we come out of that. We come out of what that window of tolerance is. And this is the thing that I show to a lot of clients and clients who've suffered from anxiety for years and teach them, you know, how to recognize when they're coming out of the window of tolerance, to teach them on the, the vagus nerve, this is our door, you know, our ventral vagus, which is important for our safety. And then we have our, um, our sympathetic, which is our fear. And then our, our dorsal and our stomach area, which is um, our shutdown. Because when people go into, when people have a threat, and you might know this with, you know, friends that have anxiety or anybody that does have anxiety, when the threat, when the fear comes, when the anxiety rises, some people go into that fight or flight and they go into what we call hyperarousal. And hyperarousal is your heart's beating out of your chest. You know, you're going a million miles an hour. You're absolutely, you know, on edge. You just can't, you know, everything's very fast. And then other people go into what's called shutdown mode. So they go into really, I, I just can't be social. I just, I just can't. I can't engage. Um, theirs is a complete shutdown. So we work with, we, we recognize those states and then we work very much with the body, but also with the, the thoughts to be able to bring people out of those states. So it's a, it sounds a little bit more complex, but it's really just understanding that the automatic nervous system is an involuntary system. And I make that point because a lot of people I've met with anxiety, they're kind of, Helen, I've been trying to reframe I'm lying in bed at two in the morning and, I, and, and I'm in a panic and I'm, I'm trying to get my thoughts and I know there's no threat, but they're not actually working their thoughts and working their body at the same time, which you, you really have to do both. Uh, when they learn, it's, it really is regulating your nervous system because when you have really bad anxiety, your nervous system is out of whack. You're not feeling safe. And uh, you know, you think in Ireland, I used to always say to my mom, like, how is so-and-so or so-and-so? She said, oh, my God, their nerves are gone. Their nerves are gone. Like, if, you're, if your nervous system is not in, you, you have to bring your nervous system back to that center of what that homeostasis. And why, when it's involuntary, why I say it's involuntary, which is really important for people, if you're watching a really scary film and you just jump, you know, you just jump out of your skin. You haven't gone, I'm going to use my cognitive function to jump. It's involuntary. And that, uh, you know, well, I think when you work, when you understand that with anxiety, then you're understanding that we are hardwired 
we're hardwired for survival. So when the threat comes in, you know, we are going to feel it. Then when we feel it, then how can we soothe? How can we soothe? That really is so important. How can we soothe our own, you know, how can we regulate in the same way that you have a toddler, you teach children how to little children, how they can't regulate. So that's what we, that's, it's kind of what we have not learned to do and is really, really a powerful way of rather than trying to just, you have to go beyond the analytical mind. Sorry, that was a bit long. Probably all going. No, that was, re- honestly, it was really good. It is, it is a very complex system, but I, I really like the way you explained it there. I think everyone on this call or anyone listening back is going to really understand and and I think it would give a lot of comfort to people who are going through this to have that type of explanation to understand yourself. Mm-hmm. So there is a key aspect around befriending your nervous system and learning how to recognize the different states um, mm-hmm. that we're in. Um, and it'd be great that, that you, if you could demonstrate some of these, but we'll go to Ashley first to um, take us through her own lived experience and then come back with um with with some of those so welcome Ashling. hello hi Katrina um, How thank you, you so much um for being here and sharing your story because it is a brave thing to do but you are very open to um to sharing your story so it's really really great to have you so yeah I guess um can you tell us how anxiety first transpired for you yeah so um I think I've had an underlying anxiety for years um, since being in secondary school at home, but it really came to a head um, in August 2020. Uh, Not a great year for anyone, but um, yeah, I had a major anxiety event that lasted, I think it was about two months. Um, So it was just so visceral and so debilitating. It just took over my body and it was just incredibly physical um so um I actually made some notes I made a list of all the symptoms I had because I was trying to remember today and just I thought it'd be useful for anyone at home so when I say it was like visceral and just like so overwhelming to my body I had um brain fog loss of concentration slowed speech like my thoughts and my speech were just slow um, I got tension headaches, jaw pain, teeth grinding. My eyes were really sensitive to light. I got head spins, shaky hands, increased heart rate, muscle aches, fatigue, chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, upset stomach, lack of appetite, um, frequent like going to the loo all the time um, and tingles in my fingers and my toes. And then, so that was about three weeks of just these really weird physical symptoms that would um, pop up, but then get increasingly worse. And I just had no idea what was going on. Um, But then the panic attacks started. So I had multiple panic attacks in such a short amount of time. Um, And my panic attacks aren't like what you see in the movies or telly like, they last like three minutes or something. And then the person is up walking around again. Like mine really dragged on for a really long time. Um, there was one point I had a panic attack in the middle of the night for about two hours. Um, I'm not trying to scare anyone. It's just um, if anyone has sort of had any inclination that what that they're feeling physically could be down to anxiety. I had just the most physical um, manifestation of it ever. And so, um, yeah, don't feel um, like you're going nuts or anything. Um, It's very valid. And it just got so debilitating. I just wanted to stay in bed and just watch YouTube videos all day. Like that was my safe place. Um, I knew I wasn't depressed because I wanted to get up and go to work. I wanted to go up and see my friends. Um, it's just if, if I walked outside, my head would spin and um, I would get tired really easily. And so um, I was just so overwhelmed. It's just this feeling of dread and overwhelm and fear over nothing. Um, and it was actually my birthday when 
my friends got really concerned. I could barely keep my eyes open um, and I couldn't like stand up. Like I just had to be sit, sat down in the corner, just listening to conversations around me, which was like very unlike me, especially like on my birthday. Um, but yeah, it was it was definitely the scariest thing um, that's ever happened. But I I had an inclination it was anxiety because I had experienced burnout before. Um, I remember like after the leaving cert or like after exams in college or at the end of a J1 and then like you're back home and you have to go back to like um, everyday life and everything. I would always get um, a week maybe or so of burnout. Um, so, yeah, it just reached its boiling point in 2020. Um, yeah. So how, how did you determine that you had anxiety? Did you go, did you see a doctor or anything? Yeah, so I was in college at the time at the University of Sydney. So I went to the student doctors there um, because they're cheaper. And like, obviously, like a lot of new immigrants don't have Medicare. So you just go to whatever doctor is available. Um, And I expressed that I had been waking up at night with like heart palpitations. um, And I was getting concerned about it. Um, She asked me if I had ever had stress symptoms before that I could think of like any kind of high blood pressure or anything the only thing I could think of was that during like the run-up to the leave insert in school I would get nosebleeds in school because I was just like so stressed about tests or homework or I don't know what was going on but um that's the only thing I could think of and then she kind of like wasn't really taking me seriously um And I said I was getting these awful head spins. Like I felt like I was walking around all day on two drinks. Like I was tipsy all day. It it wasn't dizzy. It wasn't like the world was spinning or anything. It it, it felt like you're trying to walk down the street after having like three drinks. But I was Mm -hmm. feeling that constantly. Um, Like you wouldn't feel like you'd be able to drive or anything. Um, And she gave me this medication for... um, pregnant women who feel dizzy Um, and I just walked out of there super unhappy like not fulfilled at all and so I contacted a family friend who's a doctor in Melbourne and in fairness like I wasn't I did I didn't quite have like um the word like the correct way of describing my symptoms then I kind of told him like I think I have vertigo like maybe it's an inner ear thing like I'm so dizzy all the time can you um can I like walk into a pharmacy and get some vertigo medication he was like it's so unlikely that you have vertigo but he was like okay see if it works and like I took like a week of that that didn't work so um it just sort of increased the the doctor that I went to my GP not helping me just (laughs) increased my anxiety and um, I had a panic attack one day and I actually sent myself to the emergency room um because I actually really thought I um something terrible was going to happen I actually thought I was I was really at high risk um so my blood pressure is high but my um blood tests ECG all the tests that they do like brain tests cognitive function um they all came back fine um the the they were really actually great at St Vincent's Hospital but they didn't once bring up mental health um which in hindsight I found pretty interesting considering they went out of their way to do loads of like medical tests on me and they didn't ask me about mental health or anything like that so um I went back to my GP at UCID and I asked specifically for the DAS test which is depression anxiety stress test um because um I was doing my master's in public health and it kind of came across my way and I was like oh I'd love to take that test so um yeah um I did the depression anxiety stress test and um it's just like a sheet of paper with questions really easy um and it just kind of goes off of a scale of like whether you would have symptoms of depression anxiety or stress I had no depression um but I was off the charts with anxiety and stress. Like I'm talking like the scale goes to 10 and I was scoring like 18, 21, um, just completely off the scale, like in need of imminent care. Um, 
my doctor again did not respond to it so um I she told me to go to the beach and so I walked out of there and I never saw her again but um I had done that test that I wanted to do and I walked out of there and I was like oh my god it's anxiety and stress um and it was instantly changed everything wow what a journey yeah Um, and so once you had that diagnosis yourself did you did you feel any differently yeah definitely I I wasn't looking for a diagnosis like generalized anxiety disorder or um social anxiety I wasn't uh, um at that stage I guess where I was looking for that kind of diagnosis um I just wanted to see you know was I losing my mind was I making these symptoms up what was going on and so when I walked when I saw that um result on the test it was half the job done I felt like such a weight was lifted off my shoulders um and even though I still felt alone and I still felt like I had a lot to figure out myself um like I knew what to google now I knew what to talk to my friends about I knew what to tell my partner was going on um and it just made a world of difference and so once she had that awareness around anxiety did you receive the sufficient amount of support in managing it yeah I really did my friends were incredibly supportive um they really were um and I found um, my Australian peers were like instantly receptive to it um, and very open with their experiences with mental health, going to counsellors, medication. So, for instance, I was able to change my GP and I went to a, an amazing um, GP because my friend recommended her. And um, I actually ended up going to a counsellor that was recommended by another friend um, and it was yeah once I understood what was going on and once they were kind of like what's wrong with you like are you okay and once I was able to tell them oh I'm so stressed I'm like um my my body is just kind of wrecked with anxiety they're going oh yeah okay like they knew I knew you know what to talk about and um obviously you know friends that you trust um you know you kind of want to I wouldn't be you know running around the office telling everyone Mm -hmm. um this but um yeah the support from them was amazing and um I made some notes of like resources that I found like really helpful um and really educational and they're all free which is nice um I don't know if anyone's heard of Caroline Foran she's a podcaster back at home um her podcast is called the anxiety podcast and um yeah she interviews so many professionals And it really, really helped. Like some days it felt like it saved my life because I would be feeling some sort of symptom and then she'd have like an expert on, you know, whether it was talking about hormones or talking about diet or talking about counselling or it was just like a huge resource. So, um, yeah, Caroline Foran, I would really recommend her. I know like Brezzy and Pat Dively have podcasts as well. I didn't like listening to them to be Mm. honest I tried loads of different things once I knew what to look for and so I like I just really like she just really resonated with me and there's like a free meditation app called headgear so it's by the black dog institute um um which is a really good um uh, mental health research institute in Sydney and um it's lovely easy to use it's free and they had really like very much like beginners kind of breathing techniques um for like if you were feeling very anxious I used that a lot um and then literally just Instagram pages like that I came across um there's so many mental health advocates out there now and you're sure to find someone who you relate to like I'd be very wary of people selling trying to sell you things like there's no amount of sage or candles or coloring books or anything that's going to help you with anxiety like it was really the people that were giving out this information about the body about the brain about the nervous system and how techniques to work through a panic attack the sound advice and things you could actually practice in your own time 
like self-paced learning and it got easier as you practiced it that what that's what was really empowering um and yeah just just sort of taking it you know one step at a time and um trying lots of different things I wouldn't say there was one thing that really helped me um yeah oh thank you for that you um you mentioned podcasts there but I, I think you've been on this webinar and sharing your lived experience is going to help a lot of people because I think you know we really resonate with other people that are living through something similar that we're going through so um it's great to that you were able to share that and with with so much um information and openness um so how do you feel now and what advice would you give someone who's feeling like they're in a similar position to to how you were yeah I'm feeling significantly better now um and that was totally down to um learning and validating my experience and um learning about all those things that Helen was speaking about earlier on I felt so proud of myself like I knew what the vagus nerve was and I knew what the parasympathetic um and sympathetic nervous system was and it's just because you can envision it in your body and it just makes it feel more natural than anything like me having that overactive um fight or flight um just really put things into perspective and it wasn't this big scary beast anymore um the anxiety doesn't ever fully go away um, because it, it is that part of your brain that protects you from walking out in front of a bus or like walking into the lion's cage. But um, if it flares up or if I do feel overwhelmed, I try to recognize it early on and just speak to myself a little bit kinder, rearrange my schedule and um, do something nice for myself. Just try to not um put so much pressure on myself um as I used to um and yeah now like I've I used to go to counseling when it was really bad back in 2020 I had to go to counseling once a week now it's down to I'm on the like cancellation list <laughs> so anytime there's a cancellation she kind of texts me like do you want to see me and I can choose you know and um yeah so that's a big that's a big um win and um yeah, my advice to people would be, number one, you're not crazy. You're not losing your mind. Um, what you're feeling is absolutely real. And it's so human and natural. Um, it's literally our body working. Um, speak to someone that you trust, whether it's friends or family, um, about how you were feeling. And they've most likely felt something or, or known someone who has felt something similar. And just, yeah, like I said, like explore all of your options, like try this podcast. It doesn't work. Maybe read a book, try this meditation app um, try, you know, see a counselor, see if it suits you exercise. Like I did so many little things. Um, and yeah, just if, if once you, once you start, once you get going, just keep going. And um, yeah, I feel a lot better now. So I, I think if I, got through that like anyone would be able to it seems that the key thing is is understanding like understanding what's going on and and you mentioned a couple of tools and, and coping strategies and now we go back to Helen for um for the part that I'm really looking forward to so Helen's going to demonstrate some um, practical tools and coping strategies for living with anxiety but um Ashley thank you so much for um coming on here and sharing your story thank You're you very brave. thank you Ashley. all right Helen over to you okay. and I just want to say to that really it was fantastic hearing Ashley talk because you know hearing about her describe her symptoms that's why we really are it's so important to talk about the body because as she said you know it was a, it was the physiology it was the physical and when we understand, when, when I'm talking about the window of tolerance, knowing when you come out of it, if you're in fight or flight, you are going to have your headaches, you are going to have chronic neck, you are going to have increased heart rate, you are going to, you know, feel chaotic. However, if you're in the shutdown or collapse state, you know, you're going to feel numb, you're going to struggle with memory, you're going to struggle with concentration, you're going to not feel like maybe eating or cooking. So 
it's the, the real point in that and listening to Ashley is you can move between these states. This is a really important part. It's not like we're in, we move between shutdown from fight or flight to dissociate to the shutdown state. So what we really want to learn then is how can we come back into that sympathetic, uh, sorry, pa- uh, into that parasympathetic, into that homeostasis state. And you unfortunately have to go back up through the sympathetic to get there. But that's when we talk about the polyvagal ladder, which Ashley, you might have, we understand where we are on the ladder and we use these, these some of these tools. So I'm going to give you a few, a few um, that we can actually do. But I think the idea, like Ashley said, you can find your podcast, but really learn these states, learn about this, the body. And I can you know, definitely give, give you, Katrina, some resources. But we want to be able to come into the body because we have to go beyond the analytical mind. If we're lying there at three in the morning and we're having a panic or we're feeling really terrified, we can say, I'm safe, I'm okay. We know you're safe in the room and you're okay, but the body isn't feeling it. It's a very simple thing that we often you know, we do is uh, to come, you know, for our, for our, for our values. We, even if we put, if everyone just puts their hand on the top of their head here and then put the hand on the back of your neck and just take a nice deep breath in right into the belly and breathe out and a nice deep breath in and Breathe out and a nice deep breath in and filling up that belly with air and then exhale out. Another nice deep breath in and then exhale out. Let's just shake. Okay, remember I said that animals in the wild, when they've been under threat, what do they do? They don't stay and and they shake it out. So anytime you are feeling any sort of, you know, when you're feeling, especially if you're in that sort of a shutdown mode or you want to get rid of some of that energy, just shake. Here's another thing that we can do. This is just coming into the body, you know, just even, you know, connecting in and just doing this in with the body, but just, just shaking out. Even just putting your hand when you are in that sympathetic, when you really are feeling anxious, just putting your hand here, connecting in here and putting your your right hand here and your left hand just underneath your chest here. And you should feel your heart beating. And I like to breathe in for eight and then hold and then breathe out for eight. I'm just breathing in for eight, holding. And while you're doing that, whatever, I I think if everyone can have, you know, if there is a mantra that you can have and it might be, I'm safe, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm okay. Because remembering when you're feeling anxiety, you're, you're feeling unsafe. You're feeling threatened, you're feeling unsafe. Um, so breathing. So there's just, I like to breathe in for eight. It's the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, I take eight breaths in, I hold, and then I just take an exhale out and I do that eight times. Another very easy on the spot um, breathing is box breathing. Uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with that, but this is the sea, the breathing that the Navy SEALs used when you're under pressure. It's really easy. It's easy to teach kids and it's a really easy breath. So we will just we'll do that for a moment but we literally are just making a box to anyone watching we're just literally making a box and we're going to breathe in for four and then we're going to hold the breath for four then we're going to breathe out and then we're going to hold so we're just going to we'll just do it for a minute because I'm conscious of time but if you were doing this at home you could do it I would say do it for three minutes do it for five minutes but if you are feeling any sort of anxiety, you can do you can do this. So let's just try. We'll start at the bottom. And there's great little apps. Um, I didn't want to chance my technology here and, and feck it all up, but there are great little apps I can share uh, with Una where you can actually follow. And they're all, you know, really nicely done, but you can follow those. But if we just can, so if everyone can just go one, two, three, four, breathing, holding, two, three, four, breathing out. 
three, four, exhale through the mat and hold, two, three, four. So we do it with your finger, breathing in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe out, exhale to the mat, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. And we'll do it again, inhale. So on that one, can you feel any difference in that? Just slow it down, but just make sure that you exhale out. So another one that I really like to do is this one is called, um, we're tapping. So we're using some, um, um, like almost we're coming along with the meridians in the body and we are, it's like an acupressure and this is a very helpful technique. So I'm gonna show you the tapping points. Is anybody familiar with tapping? No? All right, so we have, and it doesn't matter if we get this wrong or we don't do it in the right order, but it's a really great um, tool to use. So your first tapping point, because we're going to really, is going to be on the karate chop, which is here, which really connects into your small intestine. So what, right or left hand, whichever is more comfortable for you, I'm just going with the right, okay? Then the next tapping point is at the top of the head. That's our governing vessel, okay? The next tapping point is going to be up here at the top of our eyebrows, which is the bladder meridian. The next tapping point is going to be at the side of the eye, which is the gallbladder meridian. And then we're going to go under the eye, which is the stomach meridian. And then we're going to go under the nose. And then we're going to go on the chin which is the governing vessel, and we're gonna do the collarbones. And then we're just gonna go under the arm, under just along here. So they're the tapping points that we normally work descending. Um, don't worry if we, uh, if we get these, but if we don't get these right. But what we're doing is we're just putting this pressure onto these points. So all you have to do is repeat after me, and this, this little exercise will probably take about three minutes, but um, just repeat after me. And if we get them mixed up, there's no drama. Okay, so we're going to start here. And you just, everybody just repeat after I finish the end of the sentence. So, so we'll start, we'll start at the top of the head, okay? And we're gonna do seven taps, okay? Even though I feel so much anxiety about everything that's going on. Even though I feel so much anxiety about everything that's going on. I choose to relax. I choose to relax and feel safe now and feel safe now even though this feels so overwhelming even though this feels so overwhelming I choose to relax I choose to relax and feel safe now and feel safe now there's so much going on there's so much going on and that's okay and that's okay there's so much going on. There's so much going on. And that's okay. And that's okay. It's safe to feel this anxiety. It's safe to feel this anxiety. And it's safe to let it go. And it's safe to let it go. It's safe to feel all the stress. It's safe to feel all the stress. And it's safe to let it go. And it's safe to let it go. I acknowledge all my stress. I acknowledge all my stress. And I begin to feel safe in my body. And I begin to feel safe in my body. The more I relax. The more I relax. The more my body heals. The more my body heals. Letting go now. 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 How do we find that? That was lovely. 
Yeah. So that, and you would bring in your own words with that. That's just, I'm just in the interest of time, keeping that really short. But what can be really powerful is you can bring in, you know, for your own words and then you're tapping and it's much easier when you're doing it yourself, but you're coming in and you're coming into those acupressure points and um, that you can do in a minute or two minutes. And it's a really easy tool to do. So just remembering we've got this one here, which is always just being able to come into the body. I'm okay. Everything's okay. I'm okay. And here, you know, this one here. Um, from a, We always want to anchor and ground back to a feeling of safety when we're feeling off. Okay. We want to be able to, even if our mind is racing, we want to be able to anchor into safety. So if you're out somewhere or you're in an office and you're feeling anxiety and you think, oh my God, I can't start tapping. I can't, you know, I'm in a queue somewhere. I can't. A great thing to do for grounding is just to say, what are five things that I can see? You know, five things I can smell, five things um, I can, um, you know, feel. So you want to come back into present moment because a really when we recognize what's happening is, and this is a really gentle reminder that, you know, we're not our thoughts, right? So we're not our thoughts, we're not our beliefs, we're not our emotions. Um, you know, we, we, we take all of these things from the past and we allow them to sort of steer or, or, or kind of guide us. And if we can just give ourselves a little bit of breath and be the observer for that, then we can create enough space that then we can choose. So a great grounding to bring us back into presence um, and, and not, you know, and, and knowing that, you know, when we're in presence, then we can actually, if we do that, five things I can see, five things I can uh, feel or five things I can hear, it'll bring you into the now. So if you're out somewhere, that's a, that's a particularly good um, exercise to do. The other thing is, um, which Ashley mentioned, uh, which is really important from a holistic perspective, is recognizing if you are struggling with anxiety, everything that you is in your environment. So everything you're eating, we can't have this discussion because it is so important to know that the, I mean, the gut is our primal brain. So really important to know um, how we're fueling the body and that certain food and obviously substances, you know, alcohol is only going to increase anyone who's got really bad anxiety on their drinking a lot. It really is going to increase. So um, we want to kind of really recognize um, diet um, and, and food when we're, we're having this other tools. I don't know whether you can see here, but something um, I don't know, my lights kind of gone a little bit. I'll just put this on, but is really around, um, finding for you um sorry this is just my light so finding for you um music drumming if anybody here i'm hoping in the irish community lots of people have drums but drumming is a fantastic anything that you can use as well to kind of change your uh, brain, you know, we can move our brain, um, our states um, to uh, music is absolutely fantastic. So we can use, you know, I've got a drum there, a baron drum. I hope anyone who has got drums or anyone, if you know, just listening to binaural beats and listening to certain frequencies of music um, are incredibly powerful and have a really, um, you know, can, uh, you know, they can really shift and alter your brain states. So music, absolutely, um, you know, we can use. Um, so there are just a few. There are so many, though, um, you know, exercises about coming, you know, about being able to come into the body. But I will just demonstrate one last thing, which is which um, is good if you have. Because remember, I'm saying animal shape. It's all, it's, it's, we're trying to regulate the nervous system. We're trying to get some of this energy out. So if you've got a lot of kind of anger or pent up or energy, you can always do. And if you want to just do this with me, um, right, everyone. So just taking your arm up. So just going, so imagine if we really want to get this energy out if you're angry or there's a lot of anxiety built up. So it's Shake it out. 
Um, how does that feel? Can you feel that? Can you feel that even coming in, in, in the body? And that's if we are looking at really if we are in that sort of really kind of a shutdown state that we are in an anger state that we want to kind of get some of that energy. There are other things in terms of which is very powerful uh, for our nervous system is we can just shake and I won't do it here, but you can lie on the ground and you can literally, when you're feeling all of this, you know, shake a right arm, shake your left arm, um, shake your leg. You know, this is the way you would sit and you would bring a leg up like that and really just shaking and shaking and then notice how the body, because we're looking at, uh, we're looking at getting some of uh, this energy out of the body or else. So the exercises, if you are really, really in that fight or flight, we want to calm and we want to ground. So that's just the slower breathing exercise and maybe some of the music that is quieter and or going for a walk. And then the other exercises, and I can put these out, are more if we are in the shutdown or collapse and we've got little energy, then we're going to try and, and bring us out of that state. There are so many, but I'm sorry, I'm just trying to show you a couple. But um, yeah, there's so many that we can actually. No, well, look, I think that's absolutely fantastic what you've shared um, and some really, really practical tools that you can do from anywhere, from your home. You know, you don't have to go out and seek someone to do these. And I think it's just something that everyone should really have up their sleeve and, and understand. Um, but I'm, I am just mindful of time, so I might go quickly to the um, to see if anyone has any questions. Um, so yeah, I'll just open the field there for anyone if if anyone's got a, um, any questions that they'd like to ask Helen or or Ashley. Um, I've got a question for Helen. Um, Helen, what would you say to someone if they were a chronic worrier they were they worried about the future they were worrying about uh what people thought or they were worrying about events that have not happened yet they're worrying about things in the future that the possibility of happening might be there but they have not happened yet I think I would want to understand so that they would have you know I'd I'd, I'd want to understand it sounds like they have um uh you know, there's something within their belief system. I'd, I'd want to understand for that particular individual, you know, what their history really is, because, um, you know, if they're worrying, um, there, there might be a limiting belief there, a belief that, you know, something bad is going to happen in the future. And um, so I really would need to understand. I'd be really curious to understanding what part of them, because, you know, we're made up of many, many different parts and, um, you know, in the same way that we could say, you know, um, a part of me is worrying, not all of them is worrying, but there's a part of them in the same way we say, you know, we say I'm I have anxiety. We could change that to a part of me feels anxious, which is inferring other parts don't. So I'd be really curious in understanding what is it within them um, that is, you know, that is causing them to really um, be worrying about every single thing. You know, that would be, it's hard to tell, I would tell them something because I'd really have to understand what, what's driving that, you know, because there's some sort of a belief from the past there that really makes them worry that something bad is going to happen, right? So there's a belief system there that we need to understand. Okay, um, fantastic. Um, really, really amazing webinar and it's been so informative um not only just with the information that's been given but those tools and i think those tools that you've provided and those coping strategies applies to you know everyday life when we're feeling a bit of stress um so it's just really good to to have those up your sleeve and so lastly how can we harness our resilience um to navigate our way out of a COVID world so we, we really do only have about a minute left um <laughs> Yeah, I think really just look, I'll keep this really quickly. We um, there is a lot of hope moving forward and things really are shifting and changing. And I think really um, when you're connecting into resilience, if everybody can look, look how far and look how much everybody has already dealt with. And I know some people have, you know, had so much to deal with, with family sickness and loss. And, it, you know, it's been an incredibly challenging time. So I think it's the connecting into just how far we've come. But what I would say to everyone is really, um, 
you know, under, you know, is, is really to start to look at what can you control, you know, once and, and also have a level of acceptance because things are changing and they're shifting. But, you know, when we have acceptance, then we're not resisting. And then that puts us into a much better space. But what can you control? You know, what what is it that you want to create? We are creator beings. So what is it you want to create? and um, have a plan and have some structure and really you know do a little bit of work on you know what is it now moving forward that you want for you what brings you joy um and um you know i think in that way you're we are creating you know now a life that's more going to be more congruent with your values and what you want um you know in the future moving forward but i think everyone can recognize how incredible. If there's one thing about this, I think it's shown us all just how resilient we are and how adaptable and how agile and how flexible we all have been during this pandemic. And that really everything is possible for change and um, you know creating whatever we want moving forward. Sorry, we're out of time. Thank you so much though. I, I just I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope all the listeners have too. But um, yeah, look, fantastic. And yeah, that's that's all we have time for. I'm sure we could stay on and, and have another hour talking about this. But um, yeah, just thank you so much. And thank you to Ashley as well for, for sharing your story. Thank you. And Katrina, I'll just say I've got, there is so many, there's hundreds of exercise and there's some cognitive distortions, understanding thinking styles. I have all of that. Um, so I can always share all those resources. At Brilliant. Age. All right. Thank you. Thank you.